a warm day, she wished she could have seen, shepherded them along the path. If Arik had returned, then so would have everybody else. The company might do her good. Yet as they walked in silence, the scent of sulfur upon Arik and charcoal on the wind, she wondered if she was truly safer because of him. Was now the time to be seeking strangers? When so few knew really what they were capable of? Wraith had heard only stories but knew this. The outsiders had blinded Scylla and came from kingdoms of ash and dust, and as vile as she'd been, Wraith still chose to believe some of her stories. Twish was a village of many sparse miles, but rumors from yesterday said there'd been a fire nearer the river, and no one who'd gone to investigate had returned, so Arik took them the long way around. It had grown cooler when they arrived in Quatan. The humble and sleepy camp, known for its weavers and claymakers, sung lively with people, chattering and trading as if they were in a hurry. Over the past few months, Quatan had distinguished itself from its older sister by hosting the same outsiders from past the mountains who Twish was less fond of, who Arik had gone to kill. Therefore, strange customs, and even stranger odors, had poured in like Turnus into the yellow lakes. They brought gold, fire-breathing brews, cackle grass, jewels, and lightning sticks. Mira said they never shaved, never bathed, and they pissed like Neshers into the body of Turnus. Boda said she'd killed two and thrown them into the waters for it. Some were said to have eyes like water and hair the color of the sky's sisters Uyu and Iyu. Suddenly stories of the outsiders' amazing trinkets filled every nook and cranny, as in harsh accents they tried to insert themselves between Arik and her, the disorientation like an unseen current from which he had to pull her several a time. They told her of wonders she had trouble comprehending, medallions that could predict, with a snipe's precision, Uyu's rise and set, or anchor the mind upon direction using a needle and plate, but had in the breath spun wild and failed within the mother's body. What good were tools that gave direction where one's sight now could? She felt clothes of thin thread and perfume so bitter they burned like a fire behind her eyes. Perhaps most wonderful of all, they had animals whose brays and clops made her envious of the prescient. They brought dogs and cats and sheep, like she knew, but also some with face feels like elk without antlers and hogs without tusks. Where fishfolk carried their homes, the outsiders traveled atop their domiciles pulled by these horses, who sounded like beautiful beings. Arik jerked her back and scolded her for wandering too close to their hind legs. Hidden dangers everywhere. They call it a royal, Arik explained, as a quat, pushed a lip of fiber into her palms for a handful of hooves. Can't get much fish for it, but the ruka will give good deals for just a slice. Wraith crinkled it near her ear. It sounded crisp and reedy. Like a leaf, Wraith said, and to her surprise laughed a little. What a silly, pointless thing. Clutching her new royal leaf, Arik guided her to the center of the village. The quats, like the twish, always froze upon a place of great significance. While Twind claimed the ruins of the old ones for themselves, the quat brought their own way of warding against Nesher's. They carved tall totems from aspen wood in the likeness of monsters believed to instill fear in the hungering hordes. Wraith, Evron, Kamut, and Mira had climbed the poles over many contests that brought broken bones, bruised egos, and sown many laughs. She'd won a few times, too, even though there'd been full-fledged warriors against her. If her father hadn't intervened on behalf of her being just a girl, She'd have earned both cheek scars to show her maturity to a bride with whom to settle. Maybe a husband instead or two, but that wasn't the totem's tradition. These days the sculptured stalks were hard to imagine amid the gathered wheeled domiciles where outsiders had made their camp. Arik walked the circumference of the camp, asking strangers strange questions about the whereabouts of this Eshi. Eshi the Yeltic warriors who, without battle against the Malvas Nor, freed the lakes with wisdom whispered into the ears of the lake folk. Her father spoke with respect for them, 
true warriors, he'd called them, victorious with mercy and without death, as Yelta slipped into the breath amid their willy misdirection. Feeling for anything she might want, she had trouble assessing the purpose of most of these items. The royal leaf had so far been a waste, worse so as she'd nearly had to fight a man to retake it after he'd tricked her into buying foul water that scorched the throat and made her stomach sick. Aye, you look into wheel and deal, a voice unlike any other shouted. The voice boomed, the accent twisted the tongue, and his forcefulness startled her. Ray, this is O, Arik said, guiding her to kneel before a spread of goods she immediately began to feel out. A hand like rock swatted her away. Ya daft, no oil in the finery. Wraith felt flushed and faked disinterest. This had been fun at first, but now it had grown a bit much. Nails against knuckles, she'd run home if she didn't feel so lost. What do we have here? You're a biggin, with eyes like does and tits like me, mum. Welcome to me traveling emporium. I got goodies you can knock your noggin on. Ain't no man here got what it takes to stack up to a dwarf. Not even that lizard. No, no ma'am. After a moment she realized she never answered him. She didn't know how, but he beat her to it. The quiet type, eh? Understanding that much, she opened her mouth to answer when he cupped it shut with a hand large as her face and stronger than even her father's. It was smooth, it was hard, and cracked like the bricks of ancient places. This was no man. This was uncut stone. No, no, no. Let's see. I got it. I bet it's... Fox, uh, the fields. Cause, you know, you got them tits and tight ass like a foxy debonair straight out of a true, true, snuffy, wuffy flickin' reel. Eight, Foxy, what can I get ya? If you a friend of Arik, you got the gems? I'll give you a great deal. For all she was, she'd been trying to see through the yellow and black to make sense of what was happening. But alas, all she found were dry eyes that needed blinking. Fearing being interrupted again, she exposed her palms, and the royal leaf, instead of speaking. Oh, pinched it from her like one might a limp noodle. What's this? A royal leaf. She gestured to his unseen goods. Now's when he'd make an offer. But what she got was a face full of spit as the man broke into a wet, wheezy laugh. Oi, that's a good one. Girl, you ain't got shite that there's half a royal's. And like a bird with clipped wings, that ain't gonna fly. Unsure why, she clutched the leaf as though it were her own. Small and square, she felt the edges where loose threads told her it had been trimmed. I lass, looks like someone played you for a fool. He kept on laughing and laughing. Wraith puffed her cheeks against the sonorous guffaw, trying to look angry. Foxy, I wouldn't wipe me arse with a hundred of those worthless shites. Her blush became fire and she rose to back away. What had she done wrong? She didn't know, and she didn't like that. Did you take me to be mocked, Uncle? Wraith demanded, then waited, and waited. Uncle? Wraith searched, grabbing at once for air. Had he, he... Arex, your uncle, eh? Well, you ought to know he walked off as soon as you left. How dare he? Wraith slammed her fist through the air until it struck something. The wood of the merchant's wagon behind her. Her knuckles cracked, and the dry, rotted wood splintered. Pain slept through her bones, and the sudden surge of rage gave way to a deeper, stomach-tightening embarrassment, so she took to kicking at the goods the merchant had laid out, and so far denied her. Whoa! Whoa! O declared, and caught her leg under his massive arms, pinning her there. The way he moved to pull her down, the height of her leg, the source of his breathing. She swiped out for his head but struck air. The man couldn't have been more than half her height, and yet, with one strong step, he bowed her back into sitting. The yelling attracted all manner of outsiders like moths to Eu. Flustered, when she wanted to run, she instead called out for help. A uh, a uh, arek The shakiness in her voice surprised her. Oh, lass. Me name's Ray. She gulped. Uncle, I want to go. I know your name, lass. It's Foxy. O said, So listen, Foxy, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. How's about this? We can make a trade, yeah? Amends among new friends? From his stash of goods, he proffered something that clunked against the ground. 
then guided her touch to a small box, polished wood, with two hinges that felt like the oxidized bronze of Scylla's sacred sculptures. It had heft for its small size, but shaking didn't appear to rattle anything within. It's a box, Wraith scoffed. Yes, you fetid quack, stop sassing me an ass whooping and open it. She pushed, the hinges groaned, and a mechanism within clicked, then a songbird's call bloomed forth like the tiny tunes of a pan flute. Wraith gasped with joy and thumbed at its innards, something within spun and moved, a wooden figurine with a tassel twirled over a metal plate. She felt breathless as the moth. It's magic! Wraith hopped to declare to all who may hear. It's magic! It's magic! Shh, O ordered, trying again to make her sit. Don't lie, I don't deal in myric tricks. I'm no reptile. It's gears and mechanisms, real engineering, a very rare antique from a far-off wonderland called the Triarchy. O closed the box to tell a tale, but she popped it open right away. There we work in big structures that spit smoke and mill steel, with tall towers taller than any trees, and live in cities bigger than entire mountains. A real rarity this is but she'd not be tricked by awe like she had by the royal leaf already, so her pap's skepticism itched in her. She pretended to watch the fake dancer twirl a minute more, then close the box. It's rare? Ye deaf? I said it twice, mother of pearl and redwood. He jabbed a finger against her nose. And boy, are you lucky I'm even showing it to ya. I don't all want something dangerous. She shoved it back at him. Dangerous? He returned it. Don't be such a wuss, Foxy. I saw the light in your dim cock eyes. It's a trinket of wonder from a world you don't even understand. Trust me, this is harmless compared to what half of your people here have been trading for. Gunnery and boomsticks, heard of it? Her sense of value skewed. There was nothing she had that she could justify giving up for a toy. Even if Evren would have loved such a thing. Nuh-uh, O declared. watch me nuh-uh. I don't know want it. She said, but the lie sounded just as it was. Liar, liar, hair of fire. Show me that bag of moss you got and that pelt off your back, and we've got a deal, Foxy. I could trade that for a whole season, off fish. I ain't no kumquat. I ain't no fox. Her voice cracked in her throat, and she shoved the back of her hands at him like he'd offered her wormy fruits. O laughed, seeding nothing but mirthful confidence. Take it or leave it, he'd meant. But this moss was everything she had left from Quet. Without it, she couldn't fletch or sharpen her axe. But she did want the box for its sound, as violence. Even hunting was impossible for her now. Here's the pelts off me back, Wraith said, and undid the leather throngs about her neck that cinched her body in swaddles of deer hide. O began to haggle back, but rather than show him the bare backs of her hands, she tossed him her cloak and coat to show O oh, her bare breasts beneath. He hollered, and she heard big metal rings shift upon his arms as he thrust them up and howled at the sky. Oh, Tits like ya tam, eh? Wraith said, coddling the box in her lap and popping it open so the birdsong could praise her victory. Ye got yourself a deal, lass, and lookin' like it you're the hottest babe at the ball. Whistles from other men behind her made her sit clever and proud. Wraith knew this would work. Comlet and the other boys had always been most frisky and feral when back from the path. They'd eat and fuck in that order every time. No doubt these outsiders, whom there didn't seem to be a woman among, had their fill of fish and fruit. Next time, Wraith said, leaning forward to bonk the short man upon a head that clacked against the wood, don't put the coon before the battle. Wherever her uncle had gone off to, he couldn't have brought her here just to abandon her. So she'd be patient, and tend the needy calls of desperate travelers beckoned she come taste the grape wine, or take a handful of shells, she scurried off to make quick on her advantage, before the other girls caught wind of the good patch of fish, and came out too to toss their lines for the day's dinner. Trading nary a wink or moss, she'd need a sled to haul home the bundles of cloth, Samples of herbs, blankets, and salted venison she'd plucked off salivating sleuths. So she dumped most of the heavier goods upon some quats she'd found praying at the totems. 
Wraith needed space for the most precious wonders of all, sounds that could accompany the music box. Ivory castanets for a kiss, a ben in a box for free, a tambourine of lead shells fashioned by a hissing man named Noshri, and a child's toy, fluffy and fair that squeaked like a salabird when squeezed for a squeeze. All these little sounds a new light. She'd dump the food if she had two to get all this fun into her darkened world. Wraith swore upon the breath's return that the music had dulled the intensity of the searing stars etched into her fog. 